It was the late Victorian era when the SS Stella departed for Guernsey in 1899. It was to be a trip filled with excitement, but then suddenly a disaster occurred, which ended up giving the ship the nickname Titanic of the Channel Islands. A story filled with ultimate heroism and tragedy. Come and enter the vault and find out more about the sinking of the SS Stella. The SS Stella was built in 1890 for the London and South Western Railway. It was a time when railway companies also operated ships as a natural extension to their service, because it meant they could often cover the whole trip of passengers, which meant more income. Stella was the last of three sister ships, the other ones being the Frederica and the Lydia. Although she was built as a ferry for the Channel Island service, she was still fitted with some lovely interiors. Beautiful social rooms with ornate wooden fittings and big skylights that allowed for natural light to fill the rooms. Lovely tiles with floral patterns were spread all over. She also had electric lights, which were only a recent standard on ships at the time. Many homes still didn't have electricity at all and that well into the 20th century. Although the Stella was built for shorter trips, there were no expenses spared for passenger comfort. And that had to be because there was strong competition on the Channel Island service. You see, the London South Western Railway Company and the Great Western Railway Company both offered a special Easter excursion scheduled to arrive at St. Peterport at the same time. This was the last Easter of the 19th century and so this was a special holiday for a lot of people and the first daylight crossing of the season. It was Monday, Thursday, the 30th of March 1899 when the Stella left Southampton with 137 passengers and 43 crew, most of which were either traveling to the Channel Islands for holidays or returning home there during the Easter break. She left at 11.25 am, about 10 minutes later than planned. The weather was calm and clear and it seemed like it would be a great trip. After the ship passed the rock formation known as the Needles, she was set into full speed. At around 3 pm the ship had entered a fog bank and speed was reduced. After all, the route took the ship quite close to the rocks known as the Caskets off of Alderney. It was reduced twice, but eventually the ship returned to full speed, sailing through low visibility. Was it a good idea, in the days of no GPS, to blindly steam through a route that takes you through rocky seas? It wasn't. Minutes before 4 pm, the foghorn signal of the casket sounded and out of the fog the rock suddenly came into view, right in front of the ship. The ship's commander, Captain Willem Reeks, quickly ordered the ship full astern and spun the steering wheel to avoid the rocks, but it was too late. At 18 knots, which was almost the full speed, the ship scraped across two rocks before ripping open her bottom on a granite reef. There was no investigation into the damage, it was clear to everyone, the ship would sink and there wasn't much time. Captain Reeks immediately ordered boat stations, ladies and children first. Surprisingly, there was little to no panic as everyone assembled on deck quickly. While Captain Reeks organized the evacuation from the bridge, the crew was taking care of getting passengers into the boats and stewards helped giving out life jackets. The Stella was equipped with two lifeboats, two cutters, a dinghy and two berth and collapsible boats. Four of those seven boats were launched successfully and a fifth capsized while launching. There was no more time for another, as the stern of the ship went beneath the sea. Now panic broke out and people began jumping off as the ship began to plunge. Reverend Clutterbuck led a group of men and women in prayer as it seemed the end is near. The ship plunged rapidly and went vertical, with a bow pointing to the sky. Captain Reeks gripped at the railing and remained at his post, never leaving it, even then. She floated like this for a while before sinking into the depths of the sea. The Stella only took eight minutes to sink.
The fact that within 8 minutes, 4 lifeboats could be filled and launched safely was a miracle. But it wouldn't have been without the instant reaction of Captain Reeks and the calmness of the crew, which spread over to the passengers, who only really panicked when families were separated from their men and a CN came closer. One of the heroic figures who worked aboard the ship was stewardess Mary Ann Rogers. She was the wife of Richard Rogers, a seaman who was also lost at sea in 1880. The two had two children. Mary Ann Rogers was inside the ship at the time of the impact and instantly led the women up on deck, before making sure they all wore life jackets. When she saw one without, she gave up her own life jacket. She was urged to join the women in the lifeboat by the passengers she helped and other crew, but she refused. She could not put a life before her own, and so she waved them goodbye and then went down with the ship. Unfortunately, the horror wasn't over yet. The survivors spent the whole rest of the day and night in the boats, up until the next day. The capsized boat allowed for some people to hold on to it, but hours later it was thrown over again by a freak wave, which actually put the boat back into right side up position, but meant it was mostly flooded. People could climb into it, but were sitting in waist deep water. They couldn't find the plug, so shoveling out the water did nothing. Of the 12 people who remained in that boat, 4 of them, including the only woman of the group, died of exposure. They remained like this and drifted for a long time until 3 pm on Good Friday, when they were finally picked up by the French naval tugboat Mars One. This was 23 hours since the ship had sunk. The other boats were able to keep the passengers on them safe. There was one cutter with 24 survivors on it that had a dinghy with 13 survivors in town. They were picked up by the Great Western Railway steamship Lynx at around 6.30 am. Then there was one lifeboat with 38 survivors on board, which had a cutter in tow with 29 survivors on it. On that cutter there was another person that was celebrated as a heroic figure. It was Greta Williams, born Ada Margaret Williams in 1869. She came from a humble London home, but eventually became a famous opera singer. She studied at the Royal Academy of Music and won several awards for her skills at the piano and her singing. Her reviews were often nothing but appreciative and it seemed Greta was living the dream. Then in 1899, a family friend, John Garrett Barnes, and his wife Annie invited Greta to join them on an Easter holiday, which took them to see Stella. Greta took along her sister Teresa, and it was a jolly group. Unfortunately, John would end up lost at sea when the ship sank, but Greta, Teresa, and Annie were safe in the cutter. It was a desperate situation. Women were mourning their men, and the crew on the boat was putting all their strength into rowing. And so Greta began to sing. It was Mendelssohn's O oh Rest in the Lord. O oh, rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him, and he shall give thee thy host is all yes, oh, Her voice echoed through the waves and through the thickness of the fog. Greta believed that the reward for everyone's suffering will be salvation, and so she sang to preserve hope for all those in fear and to encourage the crew members who kept their boat moving. At 7am in the morning, it was a running mate of the Stella, the SS Vera, that rescued them after so many hours at sea. The fog had lifted by then. The survivors brought the terrible news on Friday, but papers officially released the news on Saturday, where the Channel Islands officially went into mourning. 
Queen Victoria herself sent a message of sympathy for the survivors. It took months for the official death toll to be estimated and bodies kept washing up on land, with the last one being found nine months after the Stella had sunk. 86 passengers and 19 crew had died, most of them from exposure. Several families were ripped apart by this disaster and many children were left without one or even any parents at all. Crewman and widower Thomas Glover had five children and most of them got separated into different orphanages, never seeing each other again. An inquiry was held in April 1900 and lasted six days. It was alleged that the Stella had been racing the Great Western Railway ship that was due to arrive at the same time. Racing was definitely done in the past and highly publicized by Channel Island's newspapers, but was never officially announced by the railway companies. Their official statement was that they only wanted to cut their best times. Right. It also seemed odd that Captain Reeks, who was a very experienced captain and kept his passengers at ease because of that fact, would steam at high speed through fog. He knew there were rocks on the route, and he sailed in many times before. This is another parallel to the Titanic, with how they sailed at full speed when they got several warnings about icebergs. The Stella also wouldn't have had enough lifeboats to save all of her passengers, though in this case it made no difference due to the short time it took for her to sink. The inquiry couldn't really come to a conclusion in regards to racing, but urged the companies to not time crossings to run parallel anymore. The final result was that Captain Reeks was to blame, because it was him who ordered the ship to sail through fog at full speed. As he perished, he couldn't defend himself or reel of perhaps he was given any orders from his employer. Forty angry families sued the London and South Western Railway for compensation and the company tried their all to avoid paying out. But luckily, the Court of Appeals listened to the families and several payments were made. Still, there were some controversies with insurance payments and charity funds not being paid out properly and not everyone receiving their share. Especially orphan children were sort of left to themselves once given to the orphanages. Following the disaster, the two railway companies ended up collaborating on their Channel Island ferry services rather than competing so radically. They would alternate days of sailing and return tickets bought would be valid on either company's ships. Although the Stella is not well known today, there were several memorials made to make sure she and her lost ones and her heroes are never forgotten. The Stella Memorial Fountain in Southampton, which is also dedicated to Mary Ann Rogers, being one of them. In fact, Rogers got several dedications, such as a tablet in the memorial to heroic self-sacrifice in London and in Liverpool Cathedral, Mary Ann Rogers is one of eight women commemorated in a stained glass window in the staircase window of the Lady Chapel. Greta Williams also received some dedication and a poem was written about her by William McGonagall. A general memorial for the Stella was placed at the St. Peter Port Harbour and in 1999 and in 2019, at the 120th anniversary of the sinking, sets of postage stamps to commemorate it were issued by Alderney. Greta Williams went on to have a long life. Although there are no records of how she eventually met her aunt, she was alive and well in 1959, when she was interviewed by the BBC at 90 years old. She was living by the sea on the south coast of England and was keen on having many more years. Although she was brave at the face of danger, it is perhaps sad that all she is known for, if at all, is singing in the lifeboat when she probably wished to be remembered for entertaining many, many people in theatres. A fate similar to that of famed Margaret Brown of the Titanic, who did so much more good in her life than her actions on the Titanic, but once again she is more known for that. Divers Richard Keane and Fred Shaw found the Stella in June 1973. Several artifacts were recovered and preserved and the wreck received a protected status. 
Unfortunately, that did not stop illegal diving and plunderers stole many items. Small relics can hardly be found at all nowadays and even some bigger equipment was dismantled. The stellar superstructure has completely collapsed and unfortunately the whole wreck continues to deteriorate. And yet, after so many years in the ocean, the relics preserved still shows a high quality and the workmanship that went into her construction. The stellar tragedy would have been a great chance to change how seafaring is approached, but unfortunately nothing changed and in 1912 at high speed the Titanic collided with an iceberg after getting several warnings about ice. She did not carry enough boats to save all of her passengers. If you remember my previous shipping disaster video, you might recall me mentioning that the Titanic led to the Solos Convention, which improved the safety at sea considerably. I think that this happened only then because then it was big. The Stella, as cruel as it sounds, wasn't a very big disaster compared to the Titanic's great loss. A small Channel Islands ferry with mostly middle class, while the Titanic was the biggest ship in the world with many celebrities aboard, which at the time meant people who had wealth. I think it is a testament to the kind of times that this all happened in. Thank you for tuning in to WTH, what the history of A Smart. I am A and I make videos about historical things that may be odd, fascinating, obscure or just truly bunkers. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like and a comment. And if you are into this kind of content, feel free to subscribe for more videos are coming. If you have any suggestions for potential video topics, feel free to let me know as well. Have a nice week and I'll see you next time!